Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bigfoot Club. Robert Jesse Dominguez, Ash Tucker, Stephen Robert Dominguez. Believe in us, believe in Bigfoot Club, because we are too wee. Jennifer Reuter with Cool Gals Paranormal, and you're listening to a Bigfoot Club podcast. Hey, everybody. Robert Jesse Dominguez, Bigfoot Club, episode 33. I also wanted to talk about um, if you're listening to us on all the platforms, whether it be iTunes, uh, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Alexa, YouTube, and I think we're on... Um, line notes now too so if you're listening to us on any of these platforms please give us a subscription please give us a like please give us a comment and follow us on on these platforms and we would greatly appreciate it we're also on facebook so if you type in bigfoot club and the number one uh, that's our page Uh, please follow us and like us Uh, we're also on twitter our Twitter handle is Bigfoot Club One, the number one, and follow us on that. We would greatly appreciate it. I also wanted to say that if you have any strange stories, whether it's like Bigfoot or paranormal, if you just want to talk about your strange stories, uh, we'll we'll cover it all. Please give us an email and reach out to us at Bigfoot Club, the number one. So it's Bigfoot Club, the number one at gmail dot com. I also wanted to talk about. Um, Matt Knapp's got a, a good uh, shows on YouTube, uh, Bigfoot Crossroads and uh, Cryptid Tales on YouTube. So check him out. Those are really good shows. I don't miss out like a episode of that. So I also wanted to talk about Crazy Cat Paranormal Speaks. Uh, that's a show, a podcast show um, done by John and Cecilia Clark. Um, they're really good friends of mine and they're on all the platforms as well. I would check them out because it's a really good show. Um, they got really good guests on there, and I don't miss an episode of that one. So I uh, got uh, Ash and Steven with me. Hey, guys. Hey. Deja vu. I know. Hello. All again. over again. <laughs> Steven, how are you? I'm doing great. Um, boys are doing great. Uh, looking forward to the weekend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, we have a really great guest today. Uh, Jason McLean, the author out of, uh, Waxahachie. Hey guys, it's a, it's a pleasure to be on. Uh, technically I'm actually not, well, I am out of Waxahachie now, but I grew up in DeSoto. Um, so it's, a uh, you know, I, I really, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, it's an honor to come on the show. I'm really excited to, to talk with y'all about my new book, Metroplex Monsters. Hey Jason, just wanted to ask, uh, how you got started um, down this path of paranormal um, phenomenon and writing? Off to work, make a little money before I, you know, went to theater the community college actually to start off, and then uh, went out to Nacogdoches. Uh, I finished off there. Um, actually, my first real contact with big with a uh, Bigfoot happened out there. I, I didn't have any direct contact, but uh, we were out on a dig. Uh, and we, it was raining. So we kind of went up to this other, to Alto, mm-hmm. uh, to, to look at this experiment they had set up out there. And we, while we were in the woods, came across some tree structures. I'm like, what's up with these, right? These are not normal. Right. right. Uh, and, uh, one of the locals said, oh, that's from the stick Indians. Well, I didn't know what that was mm-hmm. until many, many years later. And I've come to find out that. Stick Indian was basically the Caddo name for the Bigfoot that yeah. live in, uh, out, in, out in that area. So, 
But yeah, no, uh, at the moment I live in Waxahachie. I was going to say, where, where was this, this stick incident at again? What part of Texas was it at? Um, it was, uh, they were doing an experiment it's just outside of Lufkin. Okay. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm terrible with names. I want to say it's Alto, but I may be wrong about that. But it wasn't even in, you know, it was sort of like in between. But it was out in the middle of nowhere. They were doing an experiment. Uh, a lot of things that, uh, one of the things that archaeologists have really got into are performing experiments. Well, they'll just like set up a, a village and then walk away, right? Yeah. And they want to see what what do animals do to it. How does weather treat these things? If you know, so that when we actually find them, thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of years later, we have an idea of what of the processes that have affected what we're finding. And it, it's often uh, what we've discovered is a lot of the things that we assumed. Right and uh, have turned out to be false. Uh, a great example of this actually comes from uh, ethnography, right? Not necessarily the experiments themselves, but they, you know, even in the you know when I was watching way too much PBS as a kid, um, they would talk about all the time how people, you know, when they were making their when they were doing their flint napping, because we'd always find pot sherds, you know, fragments of pots and pottery. Um, with with the flakes from you know making the stone tools, you could find really into the, even the early '90s this argument that what had happened was that Pete was that when they were making their tools, they'd go and they would make sacrifices because it was magic and it was all these things, right? But then yeah. someone got this idea to actually go and find the Paleolithic society and watch them, and they noticed that what happened was they actually flint napped at night while they were sitting around the campfire and there was nothing else to be doing; they were talking. Mm-hmm. And they just cleaned up and dropped everything into a trash pile. Well, that's where all the clay pots, you know, the clay pottery and all the, all the trash just went in the trash pile. So for years, people had this interpretation of what they were finding, which was, oh, this must be a sacred site. And it was actually a trash bin. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> That seems appropriate. <laughs> it really does, doesn't it? And so that's, again... It, I think the fact that those two events sort of tied together, right? Uh, my interest in archaeology. I was actually going to be an archaeologist. Uh, uh-huh. Life goes, life sometimes goes left on you, right? Right. right. Um, right. right. But <laughs> it's one of those things where um, it, it, I think the fact that they were tied together really sort of uh, demonstrates my perspective on a lot of this. I I really don't like to take a lot of things by necessarily what we're told. I would like to really see what the actual information is and see if I can find another pattern. Ask, you know, ask different questions. If everyone's asking this one question, then I'll rant like, well, then what are the other questions that aren't being asked? And maybe it's because they're stupid questions and and we already know the answer. But sometimes it's because no one ever bothered to ask. Right. Right. Um, And so that kind of is where this book came from, right? That it's, it's sort of the, the questions that oftentimes I just didn't even ask growing up about the places that I lived. Right. So it turned into this book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was, I, you know, I was, I was, I think I was messaging you like, you know, way earlier whenever I asked you to come onto the show that I, I wish that this book was around like 40 years ago. Right. <laughs> whenever I was growing up, <laughs> cause like I was looking up, you know, stuff in like library for Renee DeHendon and uh, John Green and stuff like that. And just, Right. There was nothing mm-hmm. local, and so I once I saw the like like the legend of Boggy Creek, I was like, man, I go, that's that's really close. <laughs> so uh, if if yep. this if this book would have came out back then, I'd I'd have been I don't know, I'd have been so excited, I didn't know what to do with myself. Uh, well, I would have been mm-hmm. the same thing. And the, the name of the book's called Metroplex Monsters: uh, Dallas Demons, Fort Worth Goatmen, and Other Terrors of the Trinity River. Um, it is out by History Press, and. Uh, you can go online, Barnes Noble, Amazon. You can order from there, or I will be if uh, you're in the Dallas Fort Worth area, October 31st. I'll be out at uh, Titan Comics actually signing, hey. uh, selling and signing hey. copies. Really? <laughs> we oh. might have gone there oh, yeah. a couple that's, of times. That's my that's my stomping grounds. <laughs> that's that's you know, you know what we uh, call you know, that. So, oh. <laughs> That, that synchronicity is it, it is it is synchronicity uh-huh <laughs> well it, it may not be as as uh as, as amazing as one would think well. uh so actually jesse you and i have a connection that i don't know that we, we've said too much about right. um your brother creator of El Gato negro right. uh is a huge is actually a, a hero of mine um 
uh, I was 12 when that first issue came out and uh, went to my first comic convention was to go meet him and buy that comic from him directly so that I could actually, because I saw it on the news and I'm like, here's a local guy doing it. I want to do it that way. Um, and so I, I've actually been, so he, I, he's actually been a big influence on my life. Uh, I grew up reading comics, Duncanville bookstores where I usually went and got my stuff. But when I opened my own comic book store, uh, many years ago, um, Jeremy was actually a big help and, uh, we've become fast friends. We've been friends for years. So yeah, just, uh, Oh, lots of overlapping of, of life, synchronicity, man. That is, I mean, yeah. cause like I, I, I go there every week and I talk, I, I talk to Jeremy and I talk to his mom. Well, maybe they'll yeah. actually listen <laughs> to yep. this episode at least. Right? <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been trying to get him to like, to listen to the podcast for a while now. And I go, okay. He goes, he goes, okay, okay. I will. I, I will, Robert. <laughs> But well, <laughs> now we're promoting. So, <laughs> so yep. but we did uh, an well, now, he's, for you, it, now he's got to. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so uh I will be there whenever you, you do this book signing. Yeah. So I will be there. So to to meet you in person and talk to you in person. But uh that's that is amazing. I really, really love that. Thank you for sharing that with us uh about my brother. I'm I'm actually writing for him now. So Oh really? Yes, I'm really excited about that. So he he and I were collaborating on a story right now that uh, uh, Aztec God, uh, the Aztec God uh, taught it to you. So I'm actually writing that story right now for him. So. Oh wow! So I'm really awesome. I'm, I'm real excited because actually because I I know how he is and I and we'll get back. I'm sorry we we, we ran off on on a tangent on this, but um, you know he's he's really he keeps his character really close to his vest, and so. I was gonna. Oh, t- yeah. I was gonna tell him. I wrote. I wrote like a four a four issue story of uh, El Gato Negro, and I just did it behind his back. I just wrote it and just sent it to him. I said, "Hey, I just wrote this. Uh, tell me what you think." <laughs> and he he read it in one night. He goes, "I love it." He goes, "I love it." I go, "I want to use it, but I'm not gonna use it right now." Uh, but I hey, I have a project for you. And I go, "Oh, okay, I'll, I'll do it." <laughs> so so uh, I'm pretty excited about that. He's actually he actually just moved back into town too. So oh really? Yeah. He, about here? So, so long story short, actually, uh, or a funny story on that, my best friend and I actually wrote a story based on El Gato Negro, and the idea and, and the idea was to pitch it to him, and basically was to say, look, we're not, we don't really want to touch Gato himself per se, mm-hmm. but the mythos, and sort of take it one step over, and actually set it in Dallas, and sort of say, here are these characters who are influenced by him, and it, yeah, so... We're 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 rabbit trailing, but you know what? That's the beauty of a bo- of a podcast, right? Yeah, you can you know, rabbit trail these things, and no one mind, no one minds. Do you, listeners, y'all don't mind, do y'all? No, I don't think no. you do. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um. So you you, you you have not pitched this to him yet? No, I haven't. We ha- we haven't had a chance. Okay. Uh, and honestly, it's been years. We we you know life's busy. Uh, life's what happens while you're busy doing other things. Right. Okay. Um. But uh, but back to your thing about you know this would have been really exciting to have had. Believe me, I would have been I would have loved to have had this, and really I would have loved to have had it because to talk about something in the book, mm-hmm. it would have actually helped me come to terms with uh, with really what was my first experience with the paranormal uh, and sort of the unusual. Because when I was actually not too much younger than when I actually than when, uh, when I was like eleven, so not too. You know, a lot of things seem to have happened when I was 11 and 12, it seems like. Um, but I saw a living pterosaur in Ten Mile Creek, really? uh, wow. which is in DeSoto. And it, it was, I, I go into a lot of detail about it, but the thing is, for 20 years, I told myself, I this couldn't be real, right? I, I had to have imagined, or maybe it was just a blue, it was just a really big blue heron, Um because it was, you know, the wingspan is about eight to ten feet. I got a really good look at it. The wingtip at one point was five feet from my face, but I couldn't believe it because while I believe these things existed, right, mm-hmm. um, I, I didn't believe that they would exist somewhere like Dallas, Texas, right? right? Like that's some far off place. It's not here. It's not in a suburb of one of the biggest cities in the country. You know, it's like that that's not possible. And it wasn't until actually, um, I actually gotten into cryptozoology. I'd even written a small, very terrible booklet. Um, 
about the history of ramphoractoid pterodactyls, uh, or pterosaurs rather, um, through our history. And but I never taught, I, it never connected to my side. I just thought I was wrong. And it wasn't until uh, Lyle Blackburn, uh, I'd known Lyle and Ken for a while. And again, I even knew that if, from Ken's work that there were pterodactyls in Texas, but they were all down south, right? The Rio, the Rio Grande Valley, um, Arizona. You know, it was, it, it's like, okay, they're, again, they're way away from there. They're not in the city. But Lyle asked a, a question like, hey, if anyone's got any swamp creature stories, we're doing a little pilot thing. And uh, so I thought I'd be a little bit of a smart ass. And I said, does a pterosaur in a creek uh, work for you? And he goes, actually, that's perfect because we're doing an entire episode dedicated uh, to living pterosaurs in Oklahoma. Wow. And I'm like, you're doing what, where now? So <laughs> flash forward, because, you know, I don't want to eat up the entire time. We've already talked about my my addiction to comic books for too long. Um, but, but long story short, I, I start seeing these other videos. They interview me, and I see these other interviews with all these other people who are describing exactly what I saw. Um, and they described them all the same way. The thing that uh, I came to realize, no, they're here. They're in, there is some sort of a living colony uh, in southern Oklahoma and north Texas. And the more I got into it, all of a sudden I realized, like, people started talking to me, like, yeah, I've seen those. But I'm like, wait, what? Two different people I knew personally. Once I came out about what I was doing, and I was like, no, I'm going to take this year off. I'm going to be a biblical paranormal researcher. I'm going to do this. And I, I took the year off I, I, to sort of write the book and do some of the things. They, people started talking to me, and I'm like, how? I'm like, you've known me for 20 years. Why have you not told me the story? They're like, well, you know, I mean, you tell the story, people think you're crazy. Mm, right. Yeah. And that's... And that's the thing is there does seem to be, in fact, a, a, a person just a few months ago who was very close to me was like, dude, did any, it, just tell me if anybody saw anything weird on this date. And I'm like, what happened that day? He goes, I can't tell you. Well, flash again, I'll cut to the chase. He finally confides in me and I draw it out. He is, he saw a living pterodactyl just a mile from where my spotting was. I met. Uh, and, and I talk about this in the book. There's two other people they, uh, that I met completely randomly. I started asking really weird questions during that one year I took off to be a biblical paranormal researcher. And I would, you'd be surprised often on someone would say, yeah, yeah, no, I saw this weird thing. And they would describe it the same way that I, I had had my encounter. And I didn't prompt them. But the one thing that surprised me the most, and I talk about this very much in the book, is uh, for the ramphoractoid pterodactyls, one of the reasons I think they they stay hidden so completely is, A, I think they're mostly nocturnal. That does seem to be the common theme with a lot of these, is that they're nocturnal, but they are seen in the early morning. Between, like, you know, people see them between 9, 10, 11 a.m. That's why I saw mine. But they look when they fly. They fly like a crane does, right? You know, these like the blue herons, like they'll do that S-shaped curve with their neck. Uh, mm -hmm. and they have they stick their legs out behind them, so it sort of looks like a tail with a flange on the end. Well, because of the coloration, their overall shape, I think people see these things way more often, but because we're driving, we're not paying attention, we just assume that they're a crane, right? And, like, the one I saw was a Payne's gray, which is sort of a very bluish gray. I mean, it's very much the color that you would assume, you know, if, you, if you know what a blue heron is, yeah, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't, the color wouldn't surprise you. Yeah, exactly. So like I said, the, the thing's only eight to 10, you know, the wingspan is only eight to 10 feet. So bigger than a blue heron, but not so much larger that it would freak you out, right? It's not like a, a Quetzalcoatlus or something like that. But I think that people are seeing them. They just, they don't recognize them for what they are. Because literally, I thought it was a blue heron at first until it got much closer to me. Uh, everyone I talked to said, I, at first I thought it was like a heron or a crane or a, a pelican. And then I got a, then I got closer and got a better look. Like everyone that I've ever spoken to who's seen one of these things in living has said that. Like they just said it, it just looked weird. And then I got a better look and I realized it wasn't what I thought it was. Mm. So it, having a book like this around would have been very helpful for a 12, you know, for 11, 12 year old Jason McLean trying to figure out what he saw. I was reading a portion of 
uh, Linda Gottfried's book, uh, American Monsters. And I, th- yes. I think she was. I think she was saying about there was. I can't remember what year it was, but there was a time and period where they were doing a clear cut, like a road through the Amazon. And then whenever that happened, yeah, a lot of a lot of these these pterosaurs, thunderbirds, uh, were 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 like being seen like in Mexico, South Texas, Arizona, stuff like that. So, do you think do you think something like that would would contribute to like you seeding this at at this time? Um. I think so. I think it's, well, so let me, let me take a step back on that. I think the thing is we've always seen them, right? I think my general thought on all these, whether it's Bigfoot or pterosaurs and really any of the physical cryptids, right? Uh, Because one of the things we do touch on in the book, we can talk about that later is there are paranormal things that people see. Um, But, but we shoved that to the side for just a moment for the physical cryptids. I think, we, we have a combination of these are animals that are that have very low population density, right? Um, so they're probably on the, you know, on, sort of on that critically endangered species list is where we would put them. So they, they're not terribly common, but I think people have seen them for years. But we, in our modern age, so don't get me wrong, they've been able to hide from us for a while because we, we just weren't living where they lived. But now we've pushed into where they live. But I also think that it's just that we don't assume they could be around, right? Um, as an artist, one of the things I've learned is how people see things. How do they interpret things? And it's the reason art even is able to exist is because of the way our brains think, or right? the way our brain interprets information. If you're not familiar with something, it's very easy to really missee what you're looking at until you kind of have an idea of what you're looking at, right? Right. So, I was just going to say that it's kind of the opposite is true as well. You know, a lot of times people mm-hmm. think that they're seeing something that's something that we know or, you know, when you see a shadow and it's a chair and a pile of clothes and suddenly it's a monster in the dark, you know, I think it's our brains Correct. are predisposed to interpret what we know from what we see. Correct. Absolutely. And so the reverse of that is also true. One of these things that popped in my head many year, you know, years ago on, the, on this journey was I heard someone ask, well, how do we know these aren't, you know, like for Bigfoot, they aren't just bears that are misidentified as people. But then I stopped and I asked myself, well, but what if people mistake Bigfoot for bears? And I think, and that was sort of my big sort of internal revel, you know, sort of revelation to me. It's like, well, hold on. What if people see a lot of these things way more often? But because they're so unusual, you've been told they don't exist, right? Mm-hmm. They can't exist. We have these things died out yeah. millions of years ago, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So you're yeah. just programmed not to see it. And uh, you know, we we've touched on this a lot of times that any time that kids have encounters with it, it's like, oh, this talking bear. Yeah. Or this mama bear or this, you know, whatever. Yeah. It seems or, like or bear man or, or you know, yeah. That's how that's or, how they would mm-hmm. describe it. I mean, because Again, they're just comparing it to what they know. Correct. No, exactly, exactly. And it's so. I think the the reason we're seeing them, and but people don't talk about them, is because we're we're a. I think people are seeing them, but because they can't believe what they see, they just write them off as they miss saw something, or they don't even look at it long enough to realize what they're looking at. So that's why they kind of stay hidden. But I also think, again, low population density, things like that. Also, one of the phenomena I talk about in the book, uh, and this is one of my, this is one of my, one of those things I'm kind of proud of, is I call it the green wall, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, it's one of those things. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's something I kind of noticed years ago, which was we build roads and we, we mow, you know, we, we, we mow them and on the sides, but then when, wherever the tree line starts, you can't see past that tree line on any road on any given day. And because what we've done is we've created this artificial barrier where um, the shrubbery and everything can grow real tall because the trees aren't tall enough to really block out the light until you get further inland. So you have all these really tall grasses and tall shrubs and it just basically creates this wall and it's well watered because all the, all the rainwater that hits the road, you know, goes off into the ditches and whatever. And so all the areas around the creeks, all the areas around the roads, including the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, you can't really see into the tree line at all. 
And so if, yeah. you know, particularly something like, say, the, like, let's take the 10 mile Creek where I was, right. It's like 15 feet into, you know, down from the edge. It's basically a sheer rock face on for most of it. Right. Um, and it's got this green wall around it. You could march an entire army of elephants through the, tr- through the you know, most of the 10 mile Creek. No one would ever see anything. Cryptids and stuff, right? It, precisely. And precisely. Other, others, I, think, I was just thinking other scarier things. I'm like thinking, I bet there's some people out there that yeah. you don't want to come across. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. No, no, I completely agree. Yeah, it, they're they're hiding all kinds of things. Let's just let's just say that things that we some things we want to say unknown. But the fact is, it's just it's very easy to hide. And we live in our cars. We drive on roads. We talk on cell phones while we're doing it because that's what we do. So we, there's this entire world that really is very protected from us. We, and really the only time we ever see them is when they cross over into our world or we stumble into theirs, even though they're living in one of the largest conurbations in America, you can have a Bigfoot within a mile of like two different movies, you know, uh, uh, movie theaters with all these different restaurants and, uh, Dallas Baptist University and, and the Potter's House. Like, you can have that be a thing because of this green wall. So, yeah, again, this, that was sort of, I think, the biggest revelation for me. And the, really the thing I'm sort of happiest about with the book is sort of talking about how these things are where we are. We just aren't paying attention. I never talk highly of myself. And I fancy myself as a pretty good Bigfoot researcher. And, you know, because I've been I've been with the Texas Bigfoot Research Center. And uh, when I read the story about Davy Crockett, I was I was yeah. thrown, I was thrown off. I said, I did not know that. And so, um, yes, that that threw me off. I said, man, I go, I never knew that. I don't think anybody I've ever researched with even knew that about Davy Crockett and his and his crossing path with a, a, a possible Bigfoot. So I, I found that amazing. Well, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Like, there, there's a lot of things I actually discovered about the book while I was doing research for the book that I didn't know, right? Um, and if I can stray off the beaten path or just you know follow another rabbit trail here, I think the thing that I like that really appreciated the most about writing the book was getting to learn a little bit more about um, the history of, of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, right? There's a lot of things I didn't know, you know, that I sort of discovered by going through the creatures, right? And, and and then I find out there's like, I didn't know there was a goat man in Cleaver, right? I didn't know that. But then in doing research for it, I found out that the political movement that we call populism came out of Cleaver, right? Um, I didn't know that, right? I, and so I, I got a chance to kind of look into that a little bit. Um, Italy, Texas, right? I, I've, we used to own some property out near Blooming Grove. We drive through Italy all the time. Loved the small little town. I didn't know they had a goat man. Um, I, but it, but then I get to find out also like who like who knew that Avalon, Texas, which is right next to Italy, was one of the most cotton producing areas in the nation in the 1920s and 30s. Like Ellis County produced was produced more cotton than any other county in the United States and technically even the world in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so a, a lot, like, I don't spend too much time on it with the book. I do try and throw in some little things here and there. You know, I, like, I knew about West Texas, you know, the, the kolaches, you know, I'd, we all, we all got to have those kolaches, you know, but it, it's like, I, I got a chance to kind of explore some of these little known things and, and some of these smaller towns. And I really loved finding out these new little things, these new little quirks and uh, some of the mythologies. Well, like, for example, J- Davy Crockett's, encounter Mm -hmm. and really the more uh, on my own little podcast that I do every Monday, uh, we start asking questions in many ways inspired by that encounter. Right. Um, because there's so many aspects of that that you're like, well, hold on. Did he see a Bigfoot? Was this a phantom? What did he see? Because you read his description and even if you think it's hyperbole, there's some stuff going on there. Right. And it ties very much into what we're seeing with like the goat man of white rock Lake, um, the goat man, of old Alton bridge. You start noticing there's, there's some paranormal stuff that's happening here as well. Right. And they, they, they're, 
pay attention to. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Always kind of seems like one does not lead without the other. You yeah. know, you, to kind of lump it into three, like most people you know, cryptids, mm-hmm. paranormal, and aliens. It, there's some places it's like you can't do one without the other without the other. Yeah. The more you dig, it's like, oh, well, there's this. And then, well, this person was seeing lights. And then this person had this happen over here. And some places it just seems like it's like a lightning rod, I guess you could call it. Jason, yep. I was I was gonna no, I was gonna ask you because I know I know we kind of just went off we the comic book stuff kind of like threw us off a little bit but that's okay that's okay I'm uh, sorry I, no no that's fine <laughs> our show is like that so we always get off on on we start talking about Justin Timberlake or something I don't know so <laughs> it seems a little we get a little bit better you know <laughs> yeah we're we're only a year in yeah and as it goes it but you know it happens but um, I think it makes it better. I was going to ask you, I mean, I was going to ask you as a kid, what, what type of kid you were as a young, but you kind of touched on that a little bit with the comics and, uh, you know, your experience and stuff like that. So I'm just going to skip that question and go straight to uh, what type of books or authors uh, inspired you to write? Okay, that's complicated. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so here's my thing, right? I love Heinlein, Heinlein's short work. Um, most people, like his, I like the snappy prose. I like these shorter stories where it's just, you know, it's in and out kind of thing. It's pithy. It's quick. At the same time, I am a complete nerd and I love information dumps. So if anything, my writing is, is a war between trying to be as overly informative and loquacious as possible while at the same time trying to be short and pithy. So it's, it is a war, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm a huge Heinlein fan. Uh, Starship Troopers, uh, the Puppet Masters, Job, uh, Friday, Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Those things are some of the best. Uh, they, in my opinion, they're some of the best write, written things of the of the 20th century. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, I, I think, he, even though his tone is very different, uh, again, he's he's more of a detailed or a detail oriented. Uh, writer, he wrote a book called Tales from the White Heart. Um, it's such a great book. I, I think that really sort of influenced this idea of just sort of these short stories, right? And so I was, I, I think one of the big problems is I wanted to have this cohesive theme throughout the entire book. And by the time I'm done, I, it just ends up being these short little sort of vignettes talking about things, but some of them tie together, right? Um, I did, because like you said, a lot of these things do sort of intertwine and I, I didn't want to separate them out so completely that you couldn't, that you couldn't see how one thing leads to another and influences this other thing over here. But at the same time, it ends up being very, you know, sort of these shorter vignettes that I kind of grew up on reading Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and stuff like that. Okay. I don't know if that, if that happens at all. Like I said, I, it, it, you know, if, if I could write like Highland, I don't know that I'd be doing what I do right now. Uh-huh. But um, yeah, no, I, I kind of like the idea of of, being, of trying to assume my reader. Uh, it, I like to respect the readers, right? I, I think it's often, oftentimes, when people start writing these, you know, books about cryptozoology, the paranormal, they they sort of lose respect for the for their for their readers or they're writing to impress people. So it becomes unreadable. Right. Um, I, yeah, I, I want to try and, and meet something in the middle where it's like, I respect the readers there. I don't need to tell them everything or, or fill in every gap. You know, I want to, I want this to be interesting and pithy, but at the same time, I do want to talk about some things that are, you know, maybe uh, like old Alton bridge, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things I discussed is, is the intertwining of the events at Old Alton Bridge with the mythology and how the mythology is actually part of a larger story and family of urban legends, but that the evolution of that myth, right, that I found really important, it actually indicates the changing of culture. I think that's a conversation people can have. You just got to do it in a way that, that's not, that doesn't get so lost in its own um in its own self-importance that people are like, I can't read this. This is trash. So I would say that probably comes more from Heinlein who in Starship Troopers describes his, in the entire, like the entire big point of those Starship Troopers was the power armor that they were wearing. Right. And aside from the fact he says, well, we kind of look like apes wearing it. 
he actually uses the, he says this he has he writes this line where he says I describe what they look like but you but you're probably already familiar with them because it, it, it so it's like he leaves the entire thing up to you he doesn't get bogged down in the details but you're able to stay with him and and get all the information that you need from the teeny tiny little pieces so that you don't get lost in the details so you can see the bigger themes that he's talking about so I think that's I, I don't know if that really answers your question at all, but um, it does. yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I really like that part about the book uh, about the old old Arden Bridge that um, how you like uh, describe like the history about it and and how it, it's it's morphed a little bit, you know, that story because I mm-hmm. like because like I I was part of a, a paranormal group and uh, in the early t- like uh, mid two thousands and part of my like initiation was to go there and just kind of just do stuff. And if I was able to stay there the whole night, then I could join the group. And, uh, and they, what? that's what they talked about. You know, the, yeah, you the, got hazed by your team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that's that, awesome. but that, but that's what they said. They said the goat man's bridge. And yeah. I go, well, I go, okay, there's a goat man here. Okay, whatever. So I just went out there with a, a digital recorder and like a flashlight and stuff and just hung out and asked questions and stuff like that. But I really like that. I really like that, that part where you, where you talk about its history and how it's morphed. And, and I just really, really like that. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate that. I, I, I spent a lot, I, I spent a lot of time sort of researching the mythology of, in, in, of the area. And I, I noticed something very, it was one of the things where it really kind of helped shape, even how, how I rethink of the whole Bigfoot phenomena, because I think the problem is far too often cryptids, you know, cryptids, the paranormal, because they're so intertwined, I think sometimes they get intertwined too much. Right. Mm -hmm. And we, and as researchers, we don't take the time to undo that Gordian knot. Right. Um, a great example of what I think probably happened at Den is what we see absolutely happening in Cedar Hill. Right. Uh, we have the Lake Worth monster, right? That event happened in the 60s. That's a huge event. We can't talk enough about how influential that that summer was to the psyche of the people living in Dallas Fort Worth, right? Um, television was, was sort of becoming a big thing. And here we have all this attention and media being played, you know, being paid to this, you know, to Lake Worth. I mean, that's, that's right next door if you live in Dallas. I mean, that's a big thing, right? So it, the name that uh, Jim Mars gives Lake Worth Monster initially, which is the Goat Man, right? So he gives it, and all of a sudden, all of the sightings of Bigfoot in the area become Goat Men. Mm-hmm. You know, they used, you know, when if you were, I mean, I'm actually kind of in Red Oak right now, like Red Oak, Rieger Springs, which is just uh, east of Waxahachie, Red Oak, which is north of it, like there were stories of the creature and the monster. And you, if you look closely, you see these stories in the late 1800s, early 1900s. But by the, but once this event happens at Lake Worth, everything becomes the goat man yeah. in Cedar Hill. It, during, you know, literally that same summer, either the same family of creatures or just a related family are, they've moved down. Uh, my, uh, let me stop right there. My general thought is that, the is that Bigfoot don't necessarily nest in one spot, but that they're like gorillas. They are moving. They're mobile, right? They're moving all the way up and down, but they use the tributaries and rivers as their highway. Mm-hmm. Specifically, the, you know, if you're in North Texas, it's the Trinity River. Like, that's the main, and it's uh, tributaries are the main pathways. So either, it may have even been the same creature that was seen in, uh, in Lake Worth, or at least a, a member of its family, uh, that they were moving down and, you know, and they see him in multiple times in Cedar Hill. Well, everyone's like, Hey, it's the goat man. So the name gets connected to that area. Well, over time, what happens is people start telling stories of the goat man. And then that the, the urban legends mer- morph all the in, original indigenous, uh, stories either get ignored or they, or they get changed to include the presence of the goat man. Right. And so what we end up having is local lore about a Bigfoot that's not about a Bigfoot. And so I think what probably, ha- and so something I don't talk about too much in the book, but 
I think since this is a, a podcast for researchers and people who are interested, I think this is something to think about is we often look to local legends and lore to inform us about the, about these, uh, these creatures. And I think we need to, it, it, we need to sort of rem- remind ourselves that hold on how much of what we're, how much of this information are we getting? It has absolutely nothing to do with the actual Bigfoot, right? How much of this is local legend, local lore sort of coming together and manipulating, um, you know, and growing into its own thing, completely separate from the animal itself. I think oftentimes we end up chasing uh, urban legends that are influenced and based on Sasquatch or maybe even a pterosaur or whatever, but we end up chasing the legend, not the creature itself. And um, it, it just it was in the process of sort of researching this book, like old and, and getting into the history of Old Alton Bridge and things like that. I started to see how that one event out in Lake Worth really influenced um, how people even spoke about their, their, their Sasquatch encounters in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. And even the fact that I can say Sasquatch encounters in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex seems initially almost insane, but we have, them. but the problem is because of there's because local legends and urban Tales and, and and folklore sort of popped up and built themselves around it. I think it oftentimes has led us to either just believe they can't be there because of these legends and lore, or they send us down the wrong path. Sort of how the green wall protects these creatures from being seen visibly. I think oftentimes this lore, these lores and legends that have grown up, because researchers aren't really separating out the fact from the fiction per se. It's protecting them as well from being from researchers really being where they need to be to really see them and, and, and see the real evidence. Okay, I like I like that point of view. Yeah, I, I've, that makes I've, a lot of sense. I I'd never thought of that before. So yeah, that, that makes that makes total sense. So, um, mm-hmm. oh, no, I'm, I'm, which is not to say, of course, that that legends and lore aren't important, right? I do want to make that very clear. Unfortunately, everyone listens and only hears half of what you say, right? Right. Um, I do. I do think that they are important, but we need to be able to really, as researchers, sort of stop and say, "Well, hold on, what's really being said? Well, how how much of this is just common urban legend stuff?" Right? Uh, again, I, I do a, a, another podcast, and it, like just the other week, I actually stopped my co-host. I'm like, "Dude, these stories that you're telling, these sound like every other." urban legend Mm -hmm. I've ever heard, right? It's like switch out, you can switch out uh, Sasquatch with escape mental patient Mm -hmm. or hook hand, and it would fit perfectly. It's like, like, that tells me there's something else going on here. I think what we need to do as a community is really stop and say, okay, let's put, let's take the legends and the lores, but then we need to really start kind of seeing, well, okay, are there mythological themes that are universal? Like old Alton bridge, right? You're supposed to knock three times. Well, I can find that same legend in Indiana. Uh, I forget the, the name of the girl, but it's like it's called her. You know, there's a, a bridge, and if you honk three times, she shows up. Yeah. Well, this goes back to Greece, right? It goes back to the beliefs that the Greeks had about uh, crossing the rivers. It's like there's a lot of this stuff that's sort of very large. Now, I think that's also maybe indicative of the fact that there is a larger a uh, paranormal reality that's that also exists. Uh, like I said, I'm a bit, I, I consider myself a biblical paranormal researcher. I accept the fact that there is the supernatural, right? Um, I try not to chalk everything up to it because I think that's that's unrealistic. But at the same time, I I do think we need to really you know understand that there's mythology that's created by man. There's paranormal events that that exist, and then there's just the unknown creatures. And the problem is they're all sort of melding together in this melu, and humans then start telling stories about them, and a lot of things get conflated, they get intertwined. We need to undo all of that um, in order to really see what we're looking at, right? So, right. But, well, again, my whole point was just to say, I'm not saying we need to throw all lore and legends out the window or anything like that. I'm saying we need to do a better job of really seeing what's what, and, and we need to be more diligent about Un, again, untying that knot so we can really get a good look at what we're seeing. 
It's actually a good point uh, on most of the stuff like that because, like, whenever I first started in Bigfoot stuff, I just jumped right in and just, okay, what what did you see? All right, okay, let's go to the area. Okay, that's it, you know, and. I think we all kind of start off that way. We're super, like, methodical and want to be by the book and whatever. And it's like, let's go out here and let's find our evidence and then present our evidence and scientific method. It's a science fair kind of thing, you know. Yeah. It's kind of what right. it feels like. It's like, you know. Jason, what was your favorite story? Uh, this book, uh, Metroplex Monsters. Ooh, you know what? That's a good one. Um, like I said, I loved a lot about learning about the the area in which I live. I'm the I'm the history buff, but I think, and I think that uh, you know what? Uh, sort of what we just discussed the the un the the sort of revelation of how the sort of cross pollination between mythology and urban legends and real actual encounters and how that affects how people perceive what they're seeing and how those, that legend and lores or how the legend and lore that we associate with them, you know, affect our research. I think that was a big thing, but if there's one story that I really, really sort of was like, wait, what the heck? And I, and I, it really sort of hit home for me was the hinky man of, uh, of DeSoto. Cause Again, I had my encounter in the Ten Mile Creek. Well, I had never heard of this, but there was this story of the Hinky Man of Ten Mile Creek. And I'm listening to this story, and I'm like, I've never heard this in my life. I was talking to some friends of mine, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, here's the story. And I'm like, I never heard that. But I started looking into it, and all of a sudden I realized, I'm like, hold on. Okay, Ten Mile Creek, I can see how, again, initially... Someone sees a Bigfoot because I have a Bigfoot encounter in that creek, right? They're using those creeks as navigation points. Um, so people like 10 years ago, it's you know, probably a little more now, they, ha- you know, they, they had an encounter with a Bigfoot. We talked about the Nolmans, right? That's, that's in the book. So that was there. But I put two and two together. I'm like, well, hold on. This Hinky Man legend, it's like you can tell it starts off with a Bigfoot encounter initially but then it turn it takes this weird turn where they then combine krampus with this for people who don't know uh krampus in eastern european lore is basically like the anti santa claus right he's santa's evil helper he's there to punish children well the story of the hinky man is that if you're down there smoking and drinking and you know doing all the bad boy things you're, you're supposed to do when you're 12 or 13 or 14. Uh, that, that, that's what I was doing at my pterosaur not. encounter. Of course not. None of, of, course us, not. I was none of us would do that. Yeah. <laughs> but just saying, um, hey, it's where you do, right? If you're there with your pets and, and your porno mag, man is going to come. He's a guy in the fur coat. Oh, you're in. He's going to kidnap you and take you back to, and kill you, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, that, that's straight up Krampus. Uh, Krampus, for those people who don't know, again, Eastern European, Santa's the evil helper. He takes the bad children and punishes them. He's And he looks like a goat man. Like, that's really what he looks like. He's a hairy goat man with horns. He has a basket. He takes the kids, throws them in the basket, and uh, takes them to be punished. I'm like, well, that's to say, but well, well, but why is Krampus in the middle of DeSoto, Texas, right? Like, like I see what where he came from and with the orb, but like, well, well, how? And then he goes back to again. We talk about the the West, you know, West Texas, the Kalachi. Mm-hmm. Well, it's because there's a huge Czechoslovakian right. community in in mm-hmm. sort of South Texas, right? Mm-hmm. This is why we have things like New Braunfels, right? And the is that there were, <laughs> That's what I always think. And, of but yeah, exactly. But, Oh, exactly. No, no, no. Precisely yeah. because we forget <laughs> that when Texas was being was being settled, right? People from all over the world were coming here. Right. You know, and a lot of groups from Germany and Eastern Europe were coming here looking for a better life because it sucked there. Let's just be honest. Well, you had a large Czechoslovakian um, population in what's now West Texas, but also in Ellis County, right? There, in fact. Just, you know, everyone goes, everyone knows you go to to West for your kolaches, but I'm going to say this, if you go to Ellis County, there is a little, uh, off of 45 and and, uh, 34, there's a little kolache place 
that it will give you that that's as good as anything you'll find in the West. So what you have are, is this population of Czechoslovakians who, who come here and they bring those, that mythology with them. They bring Krampus with them. So I grew up, you know, my family's Scottish. We didn't have uh, Krampus. So I, so the hinky man made no sense to me. My grandparents wouldn't have talked about a hinky man. They would have, you know, like we didn't even really have Santa Claus. Again, we're Scottish. We, we, we did our stuff on Christmas Eve. So there was no room for that. But for people who grew up, you know, in the Czechoslovakian area, this mythology grew around them. And so they, they saw a place for Krampus to explain this sighting of Bigfoot. And then he grows and evolves into his own mythology, his own story. And at the core of him is a Bigfoot encounter. And there's evidence for it, even up till very recent, uh, very recent encounters. But it's, but this Bigfoot encounter is an opportunity for, uh, for people from Czechoslovakia to give a place to something they were very familiar with, right? This legend that they grew up with, and it, it allowed them to transplant him and put Krampus in the middle of DeSoto, Texas. I think that's the kind of thing that I really appreciated the most while writing the book, and that may be my favorite part of the book. Hmm. Well, then I get to talk about kolaches, and let's face it, who doesn't love good kolaches? <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, no. <laughs> See, I was talking to... Um, my head housekeeper today and she was telling me stories about la chusa and she she wants to sit, uh, la la chusa, yeah. yeah she wants to sit down and talk to me about it and i said hey i'm i'm okay with it and then like i just wanted to i wanted your your perspective on it because i love that story with the one uh the one in um oak cliff oh right so i'm gonna be honest that's the one that kind of weirds me out well it's probably the, the one it's the it's number two on my weird out factor because again, it just isn't where you would expect something like this to be. Um, but let me, I'll, I'll very, since, you know, I'll, I'll quickly sort of brush up with the story, but, um, person I know, uh, she grew up her, uh, with her aunt, uh, her aunt was a curandara, which is basically like a, uh, a medicine man, mm-hmm. right? A witch doctor kind of a thing. Um, but it's, it's a syncristic, uh, religion. So, you know, like century, like century or it's, it's Catholicism and, and uh, Haitian voodoo and, and indigenous uh, magic sort of all intertwined. Right. That's what a Karandar is. And so she was, her aunt was basically at least one, if not the Karandar for Oak Cliff, which is for people who don't know, um, it's basically inside of, like Dallas it consumed it as it grew. So mm-hmm. this is Dallas, this is just about downtown Dallas. Like it never gets dark there because of all the light from downtown Dallas. Well, she's walking home one night uh, after midnight. Cause she's out being, you know, she's out being a teenager. Right. And, um, she essentially gets, uh, she and her friend get attacked by this, uh, by this thing that they can't see, but they're, she says it was like a horse. Like this thing is moving in the trees around them. And they realized like they couldn't hear any sound. Like all the sound was gone except for the crashing of the, of these trees. There's like a horse, like being thrown into the trees, what they described it as. Finally, her friend is like, look, whatever this thing is, it's coming for you. I'm gone in ditches her. <laughs> and, and of course she runs off and, 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 and the poor girl's standing there like you, you should, you, you better hope I don't, up dead or I'm gonna kick your scrawny you know <laughs> exactly and so she's she's trying to make it home she's got her knife pulled because she's thinking okay if this if whatever this thing is if it comes for me I'm gonna make certain it knows who is in a fight well she finally makes she she's getting close to being home when she when the thing flies over her because what it's doing is it's moving from tree to tree but she hit a, a, an area where they're there really wasn't any real trees and this thing flies over. And that's when she realizes how truly massive this thing is because it, like I said, it never really gets dark in downtown Dallas. It's always that sort of light purple, right? Mm -hmm. Or that sort of dark purple. She says the, I couldn't really see what it looked like only that it flew over me and blotted everything out. 
So she's freaking out. And so she gets to the house. She's knocking on the window with her, with her knife to wake people up so they can come in and help her out. And she gets to the door. Her aunt freaks out and starts throwing like holy water and salt and everything and swearing and praying in Spanish all at the same time. Right. And she tells her, don't turn around, but she does. And that's when she sees just again, like 10, 15 feet away from her, what in this tree that's in their front yard is what looks like a massive owl with the face of a woman. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so big that it's in, well, the, the tree that's perched that's in her front yard is in, it's bending the branches down almost to the, almost to the grass, you know, and, and it's just staring at her and it's, it's weighing everything down and she's freaking out. Well, she gets inside her, her aunt's like, okay, get in the shower, get all your clothes. So she grabs the clothes and, um, Obviously, she's going to take him to the barn, which really kind of cheesed her off because she had new Doc Martens. And uh, for any yeah. child, for any baby of the '90s knows that was a big deal. That yeah. was a big deal. Um, Those aren't cheap. Yeah. Those aren't cheap at all. I've been <laughs> I've been thinking about getting some from work because they're comfortable. Uh huh. Oh yeah. No, my Doc Martens last me for years. I'm yeah. hard on shoes. Yeah. Anyway, but you know she's in there and she you know while she's taking the shower you know she's pouring herbs on her she's. Again, praying and swearing all in Spanish, breaking eggs on the whole nine yards. Well, she leaves to burn to do whatever she's going to do with the clothes because her aunt has said that she's brought some sort of person. And while she's in the, she's drying off in the in the bathroom, she hears tap tap tap, Mm-mm. tap tap tap, tap 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 on the glass. And she said it wasn't like some, it wasn't just a, a tap. It was this, it's that sound of a, of a, a claw. Tapping on the tapping on the glass lightly to be let in. Her room had multiple windows, and when she went and when she went into her room, tap tap tap, tap tap tap, tap tap tap. A week this goes on, oh, and it was man. all night, every day. <laughs> she even skipped school to go to the West End and watch a movie with a friend midday, so there's no one really there except for a couple other people. And while she was there with her friend, she could hear, she actually asked him, do you hear that? And it was like the rustling of feathers, like large feathers. He's like, no, I don't hear anything. It finally went away, but it, it just freaked her out. Cause she's like, I don't know. Why did this thing want me? Right. Was it, is it my aunt? Did I do something? What was it? And she still doesn't even know why, but it happened and it terrified her. But, it, but, Coincidentally, I also came across from uh, another guy who has a story probably from, you know, definitely from a different time, but from a similar area of what he calls a gargoyle in that area. So it may have just been that there is some sort of paranormal entity running around Dallas and because of her association with her aunt you know, as a Karandara, it saw something it was like, you know what, maybe this is easy prey. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. But what I do find very interesting going back to this idea of mythology is that the, the La Lechusa has so much overlap with the harpies, mm, right? From, yeah. uh, right? From Greek mythology. Yeah. Greek mythology. Yeah. And, and, and so, and again, white rock, Lake. I, you know, I've got stories of people actually seeing a goat man, not a Bigfoot, but a goat man at White Rock Lake, as well as other creatures that kind of have a similar shape but aren't exactly goat men. And they're all connected to the tributaries of the Trinity River. Um, so, and really off of White Rock Lake. So, you know, there's this definite paranormal connection here, and they do seem to go deeper. I mean, like I said, we just talked about how La Lachusa seems almost identical to the harpies of Greek fame. Well, in the same way, these goat men look like the the satyrs and fawns of Greek and Roman mythology. They look like the Leshy of Russian lore. They look like the Shadim of the ancient Israelites. So 
it looks it, it looks like there's definitely this paranormal aspect to so much of this that but it also seems like this this is par- this paranormal thing has been haunting humanity for a long time and that what this is is just sort of a maybe more modern reinterpretation uh, of this same phenomena. Uh, man, I I can't wait till this book comes out. I mean, I know I know I, I have it and I was reading, but I I can't. I mean, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh-oh. What happened? <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that. I worked hard, like I said. I like I said earlier. I I you know I as an artist as a writer, I'm like, man, I wish I'd done so many different things differently. But I I, I really appreciate hearing that you liked it. I'm you know all I can see is what I would have done differently. <laughs> but hey. I'm, I'm glad you like it. Um, we're 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 about an hour in already. Um, where can one get this book? This um, Metroplex Monsters. What's what's a good what's a good way? I know you said it like earlier in the show, but I want to I want to do it again. That way, our listeners can find a good place to pick oh, up this book. Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. Um, so you can pre-order them right now. BarnesandNoble.com, Amazon.com. Just type in Metroplex Monsters. It'll pull up. Um. Or if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, uh, again, October 31st, I'll be at Titan uh, signing, you know, selling and signing some. Uh, Titan may actually put some up earlier. I haven't really talked to him uh, to Jeremy about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, you can find these. Uh, they come out October 5th. You should again if you're in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. Um, like I think they'll be at Costco and like H E B and things like that. Um, but like I said, if you're if you're not in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex region, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, you can you can order them and you know they'll they do what they do. You if you want you you can uh, plug your podcast too. If you want to how does how does one find, oh yeah uh, find your podcast? Uh, so yeah, every Monday I'm with uh, I'm on I co-host Texas Front Porch with Tex. Uh, we're a part of the Trinity, uh, paracrypted network, uh, Facebook. Uh, actually I finally just set up that page last week. Uh, you can find us at Facebook, uh, Trinity paracrypted, um, and para hyphen cryptid, or you can look us up on YouTube. We're there every week, mm-hmm. uh, every Monday, but yeah, uh, six, uh, six thirty seven thirty central, uh, is when we broadcast. But like I said, we have got a Facebook page, uh, that I just put up there. Okay. Uh, so Trinity Paracrypted is the easiest way to find us, and we're always there. We're asking interesting questions, like you know, like what we've talked about tonight. Okay. Um. Whenever, whenever oh, I, whenever I post a podcast, I'll I'll get all your links and I'll add them on to the podcast. That way, people know. You oh, know I appreciate that. So, um, yeah. But I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, we probably get, we probably got to have you back on, man. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, yeah. absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> uh, I'd love to come back on. Like, there's there's still so much to talk about. I think that's one of those things that that's why I, I agreed to do that. Uh, to even join Texas show was uh, because there's so much stuff to talk about. And we're and it's, it's one of those things where this is a big thing. And the problem is, we, you know, if you're like me, you spend most of your life being told this stuff doesn't exist. But then you have these experiences and you're like, I can't get this to the jive. I need to. I need to learn more. I need to get more into it. And the problem is there's a lot to talk about. So I'd, I'd love to come back on. Y'all are great people. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully we'll see you on Halloween. (laughs) (laughs) Or I'll have a, I'll have a book put put aside for y'all. All right. Awesome. All right. Excellent. Good night, everybody. I must bid you adieu, and so, good bye, and good night, bye!